Astro Pup and the Space Hound's Chief. Hello, this is Richard, and I'm here with the next instalment in our saga about Astro Pup, the space travelling dog. If you have heard the last episode, you will know that Astro Pup and his companion Marlow are on a mission to capture a cat person. Unfortunately, their spaceship has been hijacked by a six-legged hound armed with a laser gun. At this point, Astro Pup is going to take up the story again. If you have never been into space before, I had better explain what it is like. Well, it is big. Bigger than you can even dream of. Pretty empty, dark, no smell, very boring, and above all, quiet. We were now hurtling through it, but for once, space was noisy. Why? It had never happened before. Was something wrong with our ship? The sound went like this. The space hound pointed his nose and his gun all around the control room, looking at the ceiling, the floors, the walls, before grunting. Mmm, methinks the cat people are pursuing us. Nothing on the radar, replied Marlow, his eyes on the screen. This better not be a trick, growled the hound. Marlow continued checking the ship's systems. I think it's coming from the airlock. The sound is resonating through the intercom. The internal communications switched back on when I fired up the booster rocket. There must be a cat person or perhaps persons trapped in there. I translated this into dog woof. Ha ha ha, said the hound. That is good. I shall make this cat person, or perhaps persons, into slippers and give them to my wife. Oh no, I barked. Don't do that. Our orders are to capture a cat person and take it back to Earth. Earth, he said. We're not going to Earth. You are my prisoners, and the only place you are heading is the dwarf planet called Baskerville. Let me see the ship's computer. Ah, these are the wrong coordinates. Out of my way and he barged Marlow to one side. He was a big, powerful animal, you see, with muscles rippling through his fur, huge shoulders, and awesomely scary jaws. The laser gun was hanging by a strap from his thick neck. He used his hands with surprising dexterity on the computer keyboard and pulled up all sorts of charts on the screen. We are going the wrong way, he complained. You think you can fool me, Earth weakling, but I am not so dumb. I see through all your tricks, because I am an engineer. Now, I will fix this. He was pressing buttons and touching the screen with his nose. What are you doing? I asked anxiously. I am programming in the right flight path, he said. I know my wormholes like I know my right paw. We will be there in no time. No time, as it turned out, lasted four days. It wasn't exactly a bundle of laughs, travelling with a six-limbed Rottweiler, who looked like he wanted to eat us for breakfast. But although I was full of anxiety, I was also curious 
to see what kind of civilization my near relations from another planet might have built. I know from Earth, as you probably do too, that most of us dogs are playful, loyal and warm-hearted. If you were a child, or a smallish dog like me, you always have to be aware that a few of our kind are scary and can bite and do worse. But they are the few. As I say, most of us are good. I was confident that a world run by dogs would be a kind place, full of love, loyalty and gravy. When we came into orbit, the Rottweiler was soon in touch with his mission control. I never thought I would hear woofs and barks over the airwaves as they guided us into land. We touched down on some soft peaty ground. We left the captive cat person meowing in the airlock while we jumped out of the emergency hatch. Ah, oh, the atmosphere had a, a rich smell. Peat, wood, a touch of smoke and a distinct scent of squirrel. It would have been canine heaven were it not for the laser gun pointing into our backs. We walked over to the woods and down a path. Still there was no sign of habitation, until at last we came out the other side of the trees. Now there was a sight to behold. A small town made up entirely of kennels. As we progressed through the middle of the inhabitation, we saw that it was a family orientated place, full of puppies and mothers and proud looking fathers with their tails high. Not all of them had extra arms with hands. Most were ordinary quadruped dogs like me. That was nice to see. The six-limbed ones were guarding captive cat people as they worked with saws and hammers and spades to build kennels or dig roads. Behind the town was a hill fortified by a wall and beyond the wall we could see all sorts of spaceships parked there. Hey, said Marlow, aren't those feline vehicles? Too right, said the hound. We captured them when we escaped from the planet of the cats. You shall meet our leader. If he is in a good mood, perhaps he will give you dinner and tell you our story. Oh, dinner would be nice. I yapped cheerfully, but then I could not help asking the obvious question, the one that was perhaps best left unasked. And what if he's in a bad mood? The Rottweiler drew one of those freaky fingers of his across his fat neck and said, <laughs> The compound of spacecraft was a different sort of place. It became clear that six-legged dogs were living in the craft. Some of them were speaking on mobile phones. Others were polishing laser guns. One was riding on a sort of hover motorcycle. Whereas down in the village, there was a genial, happy atmosphere. Here, everyone was serious and quite fierce. I could see how our captor fitted in. Can you tell us what kind of breed your leader is? I inquired. You will see soon enough, he replied. I hoped the top dog was something like a good-natured Labrador. I feared a miniature dog most, like a Chihuahua. Some of them, in my experience, suffer from small dog complex and can be surprisingly bad-tempered and snappy at times. We came to the largest craft of all, a kind of mothership. It was odd to see it here, for it was shaped like the face of a cat, complete with whiskers and pointy ears. The chute that led up into its interior was like its jaws. 
we were walking into the mouth of a cat. Oh, I shudder to recall it. Horrible it was, even though it had fallen into the paws of dogs. It was not the first time I'd been inside a cat ship. I recalled there were tanks full of fish and mice and cats living up in sort of branches at the top. But it soon became apparent that this had been redecorated entirely and not necessarily in the most obvious canine taste. Oh, I said softly. I think I know someone who would like it here. That person was actually my former comrade and travelling companion, now elevated to the perch of world president. You see, the whole ship was decked out in just his idea of luxury and comfort. The air was hot and steamy and filled with the sounds of tweets and squawks. Big pots contained tropical trees and colourful flowers. Wire cages packed with nuts hung from the branches. Pretty little birds and butterflies were fluttering around here and there. It was a bird's paradise. But the general surroundings did nothing to lessen our surprise when we walked into the audience chamber and saw up on a perch, standing on one leg and clutching a phone with his other claw, none other than a parrot. At first I thought it was THE parrot, so did Marlowe, because he fell down on his knees and I swear he was crying. Yes, the ice-cool dude was trembling and shedding tears. Oh no, no, tell me this isn't true, not him, not him! No mother, please tell me it isn't him, it can't be, it's too horrific. Hmm, said the bird hanging up the call. Why is this wretch snivelling so? Surely you remember him, I said. He's Marlow. I always remember a face, and I can tell you I've never met the fellow, said the parrot. Well, perhaps he wasn't so well acquainted with Marlow. And me? Do you remember me? Your trusty companion? I asked, bemused. I've seen many a dumb animal before, but not you, said the parrot. Then it dawned on me. Yes, he looked exactly like the bird I'd shared many adventures with. But his voice, that was the giveaway. It had a slightly different timbre. And his mannerisms, the way he stood on one leg and texted with the other claw, all at the same time as speaking to us. I had never seen our parrot pull that trick. This was a slightly different parrot. Another feathered being who shared much in common with the one we knew. Excuse us, I woofed. We mistook you for someone else. You see, where we come from... Back on planet Earth, that's the blue one that goes round the sun, you know. Our world president is a parrot, just like you. Well, naturally, said the parrot. We parrots are born leaders. Get up, Marlow, I woofed. It's not him, it's another parrot. Marlow seemed to understand this and burst again into tears. No, no, not two of them. It can be, he sobbed. What has the universe done to deserve this? The parrot ignored him. He was clearly thinking. After a while, he said, I would very much like to meet this presidential parrot of yours? I expect he'd like to meet you too, I said. 
You've got a lot in common. We are light years away from Earth, but I presume you must have got here down some wormhole. Will you take me to your planet and do us the honour of an introduction with your great leader? I believe he's a bird I could do business with. Well, certainly, I replied. But inwardly, I wondered if there could really be room enough in one solar system for two such great egos. Thank you, Astro Pup, for that exciting and unexpected development. You left us with a very good question. If anyone is as eager as I am to know the answer, tune in soon to the next episode of Astro Pup on StoryNori.com. By the way, if you enjoy our stories, you can always drop by with comments on the website, or leave some kind remarks on iTunes in the Kids and Family section. For now, from me, Richard, goodbye.